welcome to our second episode of the first 100 Days in Office podcast series. Uh, we will delve into the newly elected Labour Party's policies uh, and how this could impact sectors, businesses and individuals. I'm George Lagarius, I'm the Chief Economist at Forvis Mazars UK and today I'm joined by James Robinson, a Senior Financial Planner. Uh, together we're going to look at how markets have reacted uh, following uh, the Conservatives' record-breaking defeat to, to Labour. Uh, and any planning you can do to prepare for uh, the proposed policy changes. Now, uh, as we start, let's look at uh, how markets have been uh, reacting to, to all that. And unsurprisingly, uh, the markets haven't reacted much. Uh, react reaction, in fact, has been muted. Why? Because most of this has been predicted. It is rare that one can predict such a landslide victory, but um, every poll suggested that this would be the natural outcome. Even a small labor victory in this particular case would have been uh, a surprise. Uh, so um, we have uh, a significant majority from, from Labour, something north of uh, 200 seats at the time of recording. Uh, Conservatives did survive as the opposition party and the Liberal Democrats actually picked up a significant number of votes, especially in Tory strongholds, uh, the so-called uh, Blue Wall. Uh, now... Um, the, the FTSE 100 was up uh, maybe 1% uh, and uh, the bond market hasn't really moved because the question for markets was never who's going to win this election. Okay, this was by and large a foregone conclusion. The issue for markets was the one that was completely avoided uh, during the election period, the relations with the EU. It's understandable that Labour didn't want to touch upon it uh, because it didn't want to jeopardize its large margin. Uh, it's understandable that um, uh, the uh, Conservative Party didn't want to touch upon it uh, because uh, they were hemorrhaging votes to reform, uh, which is primarily a Brexit party. So, um, it was an issue that was very important, but completely avoided uh, in the in the in the pre-election period. Uh, okay, but now markets want uh, some clarity. Uh, following 2020, economic performance has been generally lackluster, inflation persistent, and the London Stock Exchange has not been at the top of of businesses' preferences for listing. Okay, uh, so the question is, what now? Uh, what markets silently have been waiting for is some sort of nod from a British government that they are uh, happy to move closer towards Europe. That doesn't mean undoing Brexit, of course. It does not mean, uh, you know, signing treaties, new treaties or new trade deals necessarily. But it does mean two things which are easy to deliver. First, having just better relations with neighbours can go a long way in reducing trade friction uh, and um, and delays uh, and all the issues that are causing real economic harm. Uh, so, for example, there is a trade deal in effect for goods, but uh, in practice, uh, the movement of goods has been somewhat cumbersome between the EU and, and the UK. So there are points of improvement on that, and those points of improvement can be achieved if there are good relations to begin with. That, to begin with. That's why we have diplomacy. Uh, which uh, has usually a positive connotation. It is there to, to smooth out the differences between the, the heads of state. Uh, and of course, uh, there is uh, also the framework in the exchange and the trade of services, especially financial services, uh, which has yet to take a final shape. And again, uh, one needs good relations to, to achieve that. So... Um, a more a government that's more positive towards Europe could conceivably achieve better economic outcomes just by pursuing a more amicable diplomatic route. 
And that is at least what markets are, are thinking. Um, there is a caveat here, of course. Uh, the French just had their election uh, and uh, they uh, are possibly, um, were, um, the, the second uh, round hasn't happened yet, but we're possibly very close to more nationalistic government. So diplomatic exchanges might still be difficult. Um, the other thing that uh, markets are looking for in the UK is some more clarity around growth. Because Mr. Starmer, again, didn't want to alienate voters, he pursued um, uh, a more general view of growth. But uh, as our Chief Investment Officer, Ben Sigur Scott, says, hope is not a strategy. Where is growth going to come from? Debt to GDP is at 108%. The deficit is running north of 4% at 4.5%. So fiscal space is very limited. One can try to breach it, but uh, the woeful tale of Liz Truss uh, stands as, um, you know, uh, as a warning for future leaders. Otherwise, one can increase taxes, yet Labour has said often that they don't plan major tax increases. Uh, so where is the growth going to come from? So apart from relations with the EU, um, the other issue is where is growth going to, to come from? And for markets, I suppose, again, the election wasn't the, uh, wasn't, uh, the catalyst they were waiting for. Uh, they had pretty much priced in what's going to happen. The question was going forward, okay, so what does labor bring to the table? And we will learn this in the next few days, and I would guess this is where we will gauge the market reactions uh, to uh, Labour's uh, victory. Now, James, I know that some votes are still being counted, but, you know, uh, it's a foregone conclusion what, what that will have a Labour government. Uh, when uh, we look at what Labour has proposed in their manifesto uh, and some of the rumours we've seen in the press, what should people consider when looking at their financial and business planning ahead of any proposed policy changes? Thanks, George. I think the the starting point, even before coming on to what is it specifically Labour has uh, set out that they plan to do, is to take a step back and just think about what it is people should be doing as part of good planning anyway. And the starting point is that you should always build a, a long-term financial plan primarily based on your objectives and of trying to avoid knee-jerk or preemptive planning as it's naturally hard or impossible to accurately predict what legislation is going to be introduced and how that's actually going to be affected because that could change how it is you might want to plan around it. That being said, where there's planning objectives that have the potential to be impacted by future legislative change, that it'd be remiss not to just consider this and that if there's perceived little downside to planning around that, then it's worth considering taking some actions possibly sooner rather than later in, in some areas. So in this regard, we're having conversations with clients about potentially advancing some gifts that they might be making uh, or been planning to make and even thinking about potentially advancing the realisation of some capital gains as well. Uh, and there's also some some action need around reviewing what it is people would like to do around their pension planning and how it is they want to be to be accessing those benefits. Uh, the The first major change or, or most significant change we can see coming is that Labour have made it very clear that they're going to be reviewing the non-domicide rules in a bid to close uh, tax loopholes. Uh, so the proposal set out in March lacks some detail, so executing planning around that is difficult, so the actions that were once there still remain the same. But if you're a non-domicile resident living in the UK, you should consider reviewing your existing strategy and how it meets your current and future objectives so that you can be ready to execute any other changes needed when there's more clarity uh, given by the, the current government and that then you can be in a position where you're comfortable taking action. So the first thing is that if you're non-domiciled resident in the UK, that you should at least be reviewing your plans, getting ready to make changes if it's needed. The second major change uh, that, that looks like it's coming is that Labour also set out they're looking to reintroduce VAT to be applied on private school fees uh, in addition to ending the business rates relief exemption for, for private schools as well. We don't yet know exactly how this 20% VAT charge is going to be passed on to those attending private schools, 
but when they're announced planning for private school for individuals can be very important and that at this current time those paying for private education for their, their children or for family members or whoever it might be should be thinking about what am i going to do if there is a 20 percent increase in the cost of um, providing these fees uh, and seeing how that might impact their budgets and seeing what stretch they have where available uh, thirdly uh, that labor also reportedly considering a review of the business property relief regime uh, as a reminder, business property relief is where if you hold a, a business asset that that should be able to qualify for relief from inheritance tax. So it could have a zero rate of tax applied. Uh, if this is reviewed, this could significantly impact the family owned and mid market businesses across the UK. Uh, it was a relief first introduced over 50 years ago. Uh, and it's been a really valuable way for for individuals uh, to pass businesses down tax efficiently through the generations to ensure the continuity of business operations. The idea when it was introduced was inheritance tax doesn't force the sale of a business and therefore it can carry on. But it is also something that can therefore create a um, a large inheritance tax saving for those families with large levels of wealth in privately owned businesses. Uh, in particular, that when the Office of Tax Implication reviewed it a, a few years ago, they said that uh, they should be considering whether you get both capital gains tax and IHT relief at the same time. So it's something worth keeping in mind if this is something that you'd be looking to take advantage of. So with family business, family owned business being one of the largest contributors to GDP in the UK, it's an area the government will really need to get right to ensure to ensure that business can operate profitably and focus on the longer term. But as ever, it's not just a case of assuming that your business is going to qualify for inheritance tax relief anyway, as there's circumstances now where it still doesn't apply. So if this is something that you're going to be looking to rely on, it's well worth keeping it under review, but reviewing it properly rather than just keeping the default option some people take, which is, oh, I own a business, it's going to be free of inheritance tax. James, thank you for these very insightful comments and for joining us today. Thanks everyone for listening to, to our podcast today. We hope you enjoyed and please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review after listening. Um, in the next few days, we'll obviously know a lot more. Okay, the game is afoot really as of today. Uh, so our next podcast will be on Friday, 2nd August and we'll know a lot more uh, by that time. Uh, so we will delve further into Labour's policies and what these could mean for you. Mm-hmm.